Graduate Research is about. All the different nuances and the different niche of lives that actually subtly bring up issues about heritage. And in that sense, endangered language is a very interesting topic because most people don't say endangered language and heritage. But endangered language, heritage, identity, politics, ways of living in the present that is changing is totally interconnected and they are relevant. So we were very pleased indeed that Mark Turin was willing to come and share with us his experience. So Mark is an anthropologist and a linguist. He got his PhD from Leiden. He has quite a lot of travel before getting to where he is now. So I'll just indicate one or two things. So he also spent a period in Cambridge at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. But he is now in British Columbia, which is quite a far away from where his heart is, which is in the Himalayas. But I think it's likely to get it divided, and he seems somewhat invested in, in the northwest coast of Canada by right now. But then he is a professor of anthropology, and he's chair, and then much involved with the First Nations and the issues of endangered languages when you get into America as opposed to Asia. And he is chair of the First Nation and Endangered Language Program at the British Columbia. Um, he has been involved with Yale also and chairing the Research Associate of here in Cambridge. He's, he's been directing the World Oral Literature Project, which is about documenting and making accessible oral traditions, oral literature, or of um, all versions of the world. Simon, please, come on, by the seat. So you can see already now, it's starting to connect with lots of issues like the digital humanities, regional studies of the Himalaya, endangered languages, and to that also endangered culture and practices, which get a sense of politics and sociology. So, as an anthropologist, Arturo is bringing language and the study of language, the study of endangered language, into many different dimensions of how we engage with and live in the world. And he has, of course, through that, involved not just in the normal academic production of books, he's also been very extensively involved with, for example, BBC, public dissemination, he's written guidebooks about how to move around in the landscape that he loves. And and got the grants and the books and the projects, but then all the time I think also pulled back to those particular kind of community that he loves to study. By now, particular Northwest Coast, Canadian, Canada, and still also the Himalaya. So please welcome Mark Turan. And then we will actually open up for questions, even that it's an annual lecture. So if any of you don't want to be recorded or filmed, then or for that to go on to our website, then please tell Andrea who's sitting up there so she can erase that bit of the video. Anything else? So please welcome. Thank you, Mary Louise, for such a personal and rich introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, good evening. And um, thank you for extending me this invitation to deliver the second annual Heritage Lecture. I'm really honored, and I'm grateful to all of you who've come on this beautiful um, May evening. You've offered me the greatest gift of all, that most precious of commodities, an hour of your time. I'd like to thank two students at my home institution at UBC, Jonathan Eaton and Julia Schillow for a number of very stimulating conversations we've had about these very issues over the last couple of months. In this lecture, and through a number of examples, 
I'm planning to make what I hope will actually be a very simple, <coughs> if rather enduring point. That theories of heritage, even within the field of critical heritage studies, have paid insufficient attention to language. Or put in another way, that language as an embodied practice, as a phenomenon, or quite simply as a form of heritage, is under-theorized within heritage studies and could benefit from a little more scrutiny and analytical attention. I say all of this because in the classificatory frameworks of heritage accreditation, such as those advanced by UNESCO and other recognizing bodies, and often taken up by community organizations who are seeking recognition and focused on advancing their rights, the overarching bifurcation between tangible and intangible heritage remains entrenched in sometimes quite problematic ways between objects, artifacts, buildings, places, and monuments which comprise tangible cultural heritage on one hand and then traditions and living expressions inherited from ancestors and passed on to descendants as expressions of intangible cultural heritage on the other. In these catch-all buckets, intangible cultural heritage comprises all manner of cultural practice, including, but not limited to language, oral tradition, but also skills, techniques, knowledges such as dance, stories, crafts, medicines, designs, and digital heritage. Baked in assumptions about the uninterrupted transmission of intangible cultural heritage can foreclose complex conversations about colonization, rupture, trauma, and loss, in a way that I'm going to illustrate with three case studies. Simply put, is language tangible or intangible cultural heritage? And from a speaker perspective, does it even matter? And then, what happens when language is no longer a lived or living expression? When a language is not passed on to future generations, for strategic reasons, or for reasons you know, responding to hegemonic language ideologies and colonization. So let me give you three examples. First, on the 20th of May, 2005, I was invited to the UNESCO Nepal office in Kathmandu to mark the World Day for Cultural Diversity, Dialogue, and Development and to witness the launch of a publication of the same name. The audience was an eclectic mix of academics, local dignitaries, and school children, who were particularly happy to have been ripped out of school for the day to uh, have a day <laughs> off and do song and dance. All in all, it was a really authentic UNESCO event. Colorful, <laughs> albeit in a kind of performative way, designed to reconvert the already converted of the lasting value cultural diversity, and it was very apolitical, necessarily mild-mannered. Overall, a little lacking in speech. <coughs> the keynote address was delivered by Satya Mohan Joshi, writer and scholar, living treasure from Nepal, intellectual heavyweight and storyteller, internationally acclaimed for his research on the history and culture of his nation and his own community. Mr. Joshi currently serves as the chancellor of the Nepal Bahasa Academy, an organization that supports the development and ongoing use of his language, the Nepal language of Kathmandu. Mr. Joshi opened his lecture by announcing in Nepali, the official language of the then kingdom and now republic of Nepal, that he had been asked by staff at UNESCO to speak in English on account of the audience the presence of a handful of international dignitaries and foreign guests. Why, I wonder. The audience was overwhelmingly in Nepal. The event was taking place in Nepal, and more specifically on his traditional territory, the homeland of the Nepal people of Kathmandu. Their language is thriving to this day. You can hear it spoken on the streets, you can hear it on the radio, you can read it online. Would it not have been possible, in fact, even more appropriate, for Mr. Joshi to deliver his lecture in his exquisite Nepali, or better still, his erudite Nepal Vasa, or Niwari, and circulate an English translation for the few non-Nepali-speaking 
expatriates. What does it mean when an organization such as UNESCO, committed as it is to advocacy and agency in the fields of education, science, culture, communication, and information, chooses to restrict its frame of linguistic reference to that of English, a narrowing, tightening constriction that throttles the implementation of its own mandate. To cannibalize Marshall McLuhan on that sunny Friday in Kathmandu, the medium of Mr. Joshi's delivery was more memorable than the message. For my second example, let me take you now briefly to Sikkim, one of India's smallest and least populous states, nestled to the east of Nepal, the west of Bhutan, to the south of Chinese Tibet, and to the north of West Bengal, in the eastern Himalayas. In the same year as that UNESCO event that I attended, I was invited to direct the first modern linguistic survey of Sikkim through the Namgyal Institute of Tibetology in the capital of Gangtok, with the support of the Department of Human Resource Development of the state government. The goal of the survey was to generate a better understanding of the complex reality of language use and to evaluate local language teaching in government schools in Sikkim. Sikkim is home to a number of increasingly endangered indigenous languages, <coughs> including but not limited to Lepcha, Limbu, Bhutia, also known as Densanke. Each of these are autochthonous to what is now the state of Sikkim. But Sikkim is also home to a large number of historically marginalized and similarly endangered languages spoken by migrants from Nepal, from other parts of India, and from Tibet, who have carried their languages with them as they have settled. Members of the linguistic survey team traveled to Sikkim's four districts, visiting more than 120 state schools, and administered a 29-question survey to over 17,000 students and teachers. Included in the survey were questions on which language and languages the respondent speaks with his or her parents, grandparents and siblings, which languages the respondent's kin speak with one another, how many languages the respondent can speak and write, which ones, questions in all the different domains of language use, songs, shopping lists, TV, and crucially, which language the respondent identifies as her or his mother tongue. Take this anonymized survey as an example, in which a 19-year-old female student responds to questions 7 to 13 by identifying Nepali, English, and Hindi as her primary languages. From observations during the survey process and the analysis of the returns, students answered this question on their mother tongue in a number of different ways. In the case of this student, she identified Lepcha as her mother tongue, a language in which she has no stated ability. In general, the answers to this question, 21, on mother tongue, ranged very widely. Some students wrote down what language they spoke at home. Others wrote down the name of the language they thought they should be speaking at home. Some read the question as a way of asking for their ethnicity, mother tongue instead of tribal status, caste, or ethnic group. And some understood the question to be one of origin, one of belonging, and one, quite simply, of heritage. Some students just turned to the teacher and asked them what to write down. Respondents answered this open-ended question by filling in with whatever meaning they found most appropriate. As one student said to me when I turned to him, he said quite indignantly, of course I have a mother tongue, I just don't speak it. The political and strategic sophistication of the student responses to this survey has led me to ask myself whether language only becomes heritage when it's no longer spoken. In other words, when language is embodied as a lived and living practice, the organizing framework of heritage may be less relevant. In fact, we could even argue that thinking about language as heritage is already a sign that competence and practice and transmission are ebbing away, moving in a troubling direction away from fluency towards diminishment. I've come to the conclusion 
quite simply, that we need a better language to talk about language. And for my third case study, I'm going to take you to Canada, and specifically to Western Canada, a province where I live now, so curiously and so problematically named British Columbia. I hadn't fully appreciated when I moved to Canada what a rich place it would be to study and think about language, and in particular, to explore the question of language as heritage. In 2009, Canada's Commissioner of Official Languages, Graham Fraser, was quoted as saying, in the same way that race is at the core of an American experience, and class is at the core of British experience, I think that language is at the core of Canadian experience. While Fraser was referring to the friction inherent in the relationship between English and French, I'd argue that the powerful tensions that exist between indigenous and official languages are entirely central to the Canadian experience. As a nation, Canada is internationally recognized and celebrated for its federally mandated bilingualism. And massive resources are devoted to supporting and maintaining English and French. Somewhat perversely, both languages of colonization and white settlement, and therewith anything but local to those lands. Signage is a rich domain for bilingualism to be explored and subsequently realized. According to national directives, all Government of Canada signs must conform to the requirements of the Official Language Act. And all text is required to be displayed in a bilingual, side-by-side -side format, regardless of language designation. Both English and French have to be in the same font size. Additionally, all federal Canadian government-only signs and signs used on highways must be bilingual, and this is mandated by federal law, regardless of what the provincial territorial law is. At the same time, Canada invests a lot in heritage languages, a term that technically refers to languages other than the two official languages and other than indigenous languages. As Duff and Lee outlined in their 2019 article, Canada has long been a leader in developing proactive policies and initiatives to support minority and heritage language instruction and maintenance. And indeed, the term heritage language education, you see here, learn German in Germany, seems to have originated within the Canadian experience, despite the fact we have many programs like that in the UK and also in the States and Australia, they go often by other names, community language programs, complementary language programs, ancestral language programs, and immigrant language programs. <coughs> in Canada, and I think more widely, heritage language essentially refers to languages that were originally spoken somewhere else. Languages that were brought to North America by speakers as they migrated and as they settled. Importantly, the term heritage language invokes ancestry, rather than nationality. It's agnostic about contemporary spoken ability, so you're conversational but not able to write. And you speak with your grandparents and talk at cultural events, but you don't know words of politics and technology. And, this is key, heritage language locates fluency and the linguistic homeland outside and beyond the country of settlement. In other words, should a young Canadian forget all of her or his Mandarin, Tagalog, Punjabi, Arabic, Urdu, or Spanish, there's a homeland, and in some cases more than one homeland, where you can go to relearn and study the language, immerse yourself in your ancestral culture. This is a privilege and an option not available to indigenous languages and the communities who speak them. First Nations languages have been spoken and sung for thousands of years on the territories currently known as Canada. These languages have been accorded neither federal status as official languages, nor can they draw on the generous resources extended to heritage language communities, nor do they have a homeland beyond their traditional territory to which speakers can return for immersive language camps and summer cultural program. Indigenous leaders in Canada have long advocated for indigenous language revitalization to be a national and pressing issue. While English and French have federal support and protection 
What place do indigenous languages hold in the national consciousness? Nunavut and the Northern Territories, two of Canada's territories, accord official status to indigenous languages. In Nunavut, both Inuktitut and Inunakum have official status alongside English and French. Inuktitut is commonly used in the territorial government administration, and all signs, like the one you see here, are required to use the four official languages of the territory. The Official Languages Act of the Northwestern Territories goes a step further. This act recognizes 11 languages. It's the only political region in Canada to do so. Of the 11, nine are indigenous. They belong to three different language families, Dene, Inuit, and Cree. I find it noteworthy that in the 18 pages of legislation, heritage is never mentioned, not once. Reading the 1988 legislation, the focus is clear. Extending legal protection to indigenous languages as a means to support the preservation of the culture of the people expressed through language. In the legislation, the preservation and enhancement of these languages is a shared responsibility of everyone who lives in the territory. The act established a minister responsible for official languages, a languages commissioner, and a language revitalization board. Some have asked what it means to accord official status to 11 languages in a territory where the entire population is less than 45,000 and distributed across 1 million square kilometers. And how efficacious this is. Others, such as Chief Dr. Ronald Ignace of the Skeechistan Band, who I interviewed in November last year, are skeptical of the long-term gains of this approach. Dr. Ignace's interpretation of the Official Languages Act of the Northwest Territory is that the consequence of its promulgation has been that the lion's share of resources flow to increased linguistic bureaucratization, translating laws, legislation, and government documents into nine indigenous languages. Little money left, therefore, for communities to actually strengthen and enhance their spoken ability. According to Chief Ignace, the Northwest Territory now have ever more documents in indigenous languages and ever fewer speakers. Instead, he argues the focus at the federal level, a struggle that he's been involved in for 30 years, should be on legislative recognition rather than official status to avoid allocating all resources to administration. On December 6, 2016, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau delivered a very carefully prepared speech to the Assembly of First Nations Chiefs. Riding high on a wave of popularity that accompanied his recent election, Trudeau committed the Federal Government of Canada to enacting an Indigenous Languages Act, co-developed with Indigenous peoples, with the goal of ensuring the preservation, protection, and revitalization of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit languages in this country. The legislation is now wending its way through Parliament, and Dr. Ignace and other Indigenous leaders are working tirelessly to ensure that it produces long-term, stable, predictable funding, so that communities can begin training teachers and establishing curriculum programs that will nurture the next generation of language speakers, rather than more multilingual tax returns. The 1996 Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights has not been formally adopted by the UN. In it, linguistic rights are defined as the right to express yourself in your own language, in both personal and professional settings. The Declaration considers all languages to be equal, and it rejects the term official, regional, or minority language, strongly advocating for the full use of all language. Languages are spoken by communities. Sahatya May Talbot was born in February 2014 to her Dene Chippewan mother, Shane Katholik Valpi, in Canada's Northwest Territory. Sahatya, you see her on the left, smiling, went without a birth certificate <coughs> for a whole year because the territorial government was unable to register a name that was not written in the Roman alphabet. 
In October 2015, the Northwest Territories Language Commissioner, established by the Act of which I just spoke, Shannon Goldberg, acknowledged that the territorial government had an obligation to provide services in all of its official languages, including indigenous languages, for birth certificates and registration. By not allowing and not supporting names that contained denifants and diacritics, Goldberg noted that one act, the Vital Statistics Act, had violated the spirit of another act, the Official Languages Act. Valpi's story promoted amendments to the Northwest Territories legislation in July 2017. At that point, many people thought the case had been concluded successfully. But these changes have not yet been implemented. I haven't won the battle yet, Ms. Alpi said in a CBC interview. A part of me feels I should just give up. But thankfully for her children and for many other families in the territories, she's become an advocate for the cause. Sahaya has now been joined by her younger sister, Nael, whose first name is spelt without the intervocalic glottal stop on her birth certificate. The glottal stop in Denny is crucial for the pronunciation and meaning of both names. In their language, simply put, the glottal stop is not an option, it's required. Valpi's case is a prime example of the violation of a linguistic right, namely the right to use your own name. The reason for the violation is all too often something very mundane, in this case a bottleneck, in moving from theory to practice and implementation. According to media reports, the cause of the blockage appears to be a lingering worry that the introduction of non-Roman characters and fonts into their database will cause meltdown. While the amendment that supported the citizens of the territories to have their names represented accurately was passed into legislation some years ago now, a right is not merely fulfilled by acknowledging a wrong and by advancing a law. Technology and logistics have to catch up. There has to be a will to see the changes through and follow legislation into implementation. This high profile case has garnered national media attention, helped change territorial law, and gained support of high profile government officials. But the process is slow and ongoing, and will only see successful conclusion because of the persistence, the resources, and skills of Ms. Valpi, a committed community activist whose extraordinary work I just like to recognize here. The paperwork's crazy, she said recently. And then you have elders who can't properly read or write. Too many of us are still unaware of the rich linguistic diversity of indigenous languages spoken around us, of the understandings and knowledge encoded within these languages and their importance to community. Connected to territory through traditional ecological knowledge, and ceremony. Indigenous languages have vast historical depth and are at the same time entirely modern, visible on social media, mobilized through online dictionaries, radio, art, and music. Indigenous languages are spoken and taught in communities from Hawaii to Nepal, Greenland to South Africa. The bitter irony of the current context is inescapable. Colonial governments have for centuries marshaled their economic and military administrative might to extinguish indigenous voices. Now, in the 11th hour, governments are looking to resource that which they first set out to destroy. Many indigenous commentators point to the fact that benign neglect would have been a lot less damaging and more welcome than two centuries of violence followed by the last minute you turn. 2016 was an important year. The United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution that proclaims this year, 2019, the International Year of Indigenous Languages, to help promote and protect indigenous languages around the world. While this celebration of indigenous linguistic vitality and resilience is welcome, we may ask whether it's enough and whether UNESCO the United Nations agency charged with overseeing activities for this year has the necessary carrots and sticks to bring forth lasting change. 
We need more than a year, said Dr. Dali Sambogoro, chair of the Arctic Circumpolar Council, when she delivered the 2019 Global Indigenous Rights Lecture at my university earlier this year. Instead of a year, let's go for a decade, she said. We need to recognize that it takes much longer than a year to transmit linguistic knowledge intergenerationally and to truly revitalize a language. To cite Ryan DeClaire, Assistant Professor of Indigenous Languages at the University of Toronto, teacher and speaker of Kanyangeha, the Mohawk language, people revitalize a language, but the language revitalizes a people. When you speak your language, you are more likely to feel self-confident. He went on to say, you're much more likely to have a sense of understanding of who you are and a sense of understanding and responsibility within a community. Recalling the central relevance of language to many other aspects of community health, the transformative healing nature and the holistic benefits of language revitalization have much wider impact and relevance than linguistic vitality alone. Recent studies demonstrate both the central relevance of language to many aspects of community well-being and how the healing nature and benefits of language revitalization have an impact beyond creating new speakers. Underscoring the interrelatedness of language and well-being, this Canadian study showed a powerful correlation between indigenous language use and a decrease in Aboriginal suicide rates in British Columbia. Such research helps to highlight the multidimensional nature of the language revitalization and its wide-ranging impact on the lives and the livelihoods of communities. Language. Like heritage, is ever less a thing and ever more a discourse. Language, like heritage, is a way of making meaning and in the process engaging with political needs. And language, like heritage, draws on the past to engage the present and plan for the future. Both language and heritage are active, dynamic processes that create meaning by articulating social and political institutions. In both heritage studies and in language studies, we're moving away from the idea of objects and qualities conferred by specialists or experts towards more inclusive, democratic, and more nuanced frames of reference that privilege processes and social meaning, ones that are rich in context and distributed through densely saturated media <coughs> networks. But I think that's where the similarities end. The Dutch cultural sociologist and future theorist, Michiel Schwartz, has written about the changing focus in heritage and museology from what he calls conservation to reuse and from historical value to social value. In this respect, language has already arrived at where heritage is going. Language is always inherently being about reuse and social value. Recalling the philosopher of language, John R. Austin, a speech act is not, not only presents information, but performs an action as well. Language performs action, and indigenous languages perform an act of anti-colonial resistance each and every time they're spoken. In fact, the very use of the prefix re in words such as revitalization, rejuvenation, resurgence, or revival, point to the undoing of some past action or deed. After all, if the world's linguistic diversity hadn't been devitalized to begin with, we wouldn't have to revitalize it now. And the linguistic diversity of our species is under extreme stress, as are the communities who speak these increasingly endangered languages. While 10 indigenous mother tongues and traditions have been inscribed on the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity, thousands more have received no official recognition and continue to be oppressed by legislation in the nation states in which they live and are spoken. And we may even ask, do such lists help anyway? What role do these classificatory frameworks, highly bureaucratized, have in our interconnected world. Things only become heritage 
because of how we interact with them in the present. If indeed language only becomes heritage when it's either translocated and moved through migration and settlement, or when it's no longer spoken, should the ultimate goal of the speech community, and in particular indigenous and historically marginalized communities, therefore be to avoid the heritaging of their language at all costs? Or, in other words, if your language has been identified as heritage, does that mean almost categorically that it's consigned to the past or located in a distant land? Schwartz suggests that we shift our perspective from space to place, it's like going from house to home. Thinking with the tools of ecological linguistics, I'd like to propose that we turn to thinking of language as relations, in both a figurative and a quite literal sense. Languages are sustained in relation and by relations. In the past, we've worked on and for languages. In the future, I would contend that we as a scholarly community need to turn our attention to working collaboratively with speakers and in relation. Thank you. simple argument that language needs to be engaged with more closely within the rubric of heritage, but have set a challenge for all of us in this room. You've questioned our, <clears throat> you've questioned our classification of heritage as tangible or intangible, you've highlighted the damage that can be done by tiny, perhaps apparently innocuous legislative measures, and we might consider what other barriers exist in our own practice, I'm sure I am. As a museum practitioner, uh, all of this forces a reflection uh, for me on the violence that has been enacted on indigenous languages and knowledge systems through uh, academic and curatorial processes, including heritaging or museumizing or translation, and the role that institutions such as museums in a small town in East Anglia or anywhere else can play in addressing ills that might not at first be our own in ways that not, might not at first be our own. And I'd just like to thank you on behalf of all of us. Thank you very much. You said that so well, that's really essentially the point. I could have done it in about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be delighted to take any questions and provocations. Thank you um, for inviting me to deliver the last Heritage Lecture. 
Um, as you know, Alan, in different languages, the word heritage actually plays quite differently. In French, it's patrimony, which is uh, extraordinary and revealing in its own way. So different, like, different languages themselves deal with heritage conceptually in different frames of reference. The, the conceit of whether language sits in tangible or intangible heritage is one that I've asked many speakers of historically marginalized languages. And what I've seen time and again, no matter where I've worked, is that it's in all of them, but it also can move between spaces. So an oral language is often classified as intangible when it takes written form. When there's a print dictionary, then there's a tangibility to it, not tangible in terms of monuments and buildings and objects, but then written languages can also be oralized again. So there's a lovely slippage between these categories. I do think that for the purposes of language work, the bifurcation of tangible versus intangible is not helpful. And as for whether the word heritage is useful, I think it's a great tool to think of. And I think we can also expand it to include dynamic living traditions um, rather than immediately consigning them in the past. But your perspective on, on all the baggage that heritage carries, of course, is located in this time and place. And I think other people might feel quite differently about it because it has it does different work for them. Um, but I, I, I appreciate your, your provocation and your question. Andrea? Thank you. My Hungarian friend then became an English citizen. He was forced, oh, thank you. So my Hungarian friend, when he became an English citizen, he was forced to lose his name. He lost an umlaut and an axon graph. And your lecture made me wonder if our way into immigration means denying our language rights and let our language and name became just a heritage? Thank you for that question. Yes, I, I think it happens uh, not only when you move cultures and move nations, but also within nations. Um, my mother's name, uh, maiden name, Ortaus, uh, was unilaterally changed by the Dutch government, her own nation, in terms of its spelling a few years ago. So the IJ was turned into a Y. Nations have that ability to define and describe their own citizens. In fact, the Dutch uh, have a national register of officially acceptable names. And you may only name your child one of the names on that list. If you choose to name your child, you know, Cosmic Apple Blossom, that is not allowed in the Netherlands, but in the States you could do that. I do think the process of, of kind of moving across space and time means that sometimes people have leave behind names, um, whether or not it's a technological issue that the British government couldn't work out where the umlaut would go, or replace the umlaut with something else. I think this is quite common, these are common governmental processes. It doesn't mean we should take them lying down. And it also doesn't mean that we can't interrogate them for what they are. They're a form of kind of structural violence, as it were, <laughs> a nation telling you what your own name is. Yeah, so in terms of teaching and um, therefore you know, propagating um, indigenous or marginalized languages, there's then the inherent problem of becoming standardized in order to be taught and what that does to the concept of language living. Um, I was wondering what you thought about how. Um, institutions should best approach manage, managing the, the teaching but also accepting the living element of those languages. Thank you for that question. And it's a very germane one, one that we grapple with quite a lot because we do teach a number of indigenous languages at the university that I teach at. Um, and you're quite right to point out that just because a language may have very few speakers and is indigenous doesn't in any way mean there's no variety and diversity within it. So you often have different variations, dialects, and people call them. I think the first way that we deal with that is by constantly sort of deprivileging the language that we're teaching and saying this is one form, maybe the recorded form or a certain officially recognized form by the community. Uh, and there are other forms as well. There are great examples now of talking dictionaries, <laughs> online dictionaries that are audio interfaced. And that means you can click on a word and then listen to two or three uh, varieties of that word being spoken by men, women, older, younger, different dialects. 
The other thing that some of our colleagues do, particularly I think now with my colleague Daisy Rosenblum, who teaches uh, t together with two elders, uh, the Pokwala language and the Pokwak communities of you know, northern British Columbia, um, she works in partnership with two elder speakers from two quite different dialects, and they're together in the classroom. So that means that she's constantly pivoting left and right, uh, and kind of acknowledging the diversity inherent in the language, and that's both challenging for students but also very enriching because it doesn't kind of uplift one form and privilege one form of standard. So it's a very big issue and it's one I think we have to sort of address head on. Trying to make it go away uh, is not an issue, not an option really. You have to engage with it and either bring diversity into the classroom or acknowledge that the restricted slice of the language that you're teaching is just one form. Yeah. Learning of the languages is a quite an interesting um, uh, question, in a sense. When I have been in Finland, when there are languages that maybe 200 people speak, I was really surprised that they start from the nursery. But the nursery with the child do not speak, but start to make, you know, two or three months children. And then the women, which are men, which are staying with them, are speaking in so-called native language. So the children from the age zero are learning language. So approach is not starting at the university or at school, but that's something which is implicit in this part of you as the culture, as the heritage you are part of or embodying, rather than something which is coming to outside. What do you think about this in terms of the heritage? Well, I think, first of all, now you mentioned it, because it's the technique that's used in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and also in Hawaii, these language nests, uh, which really are trying to recreate intergenerational transmission between often grandparent age and then grandchildren age. Uh, so that language is immersive, experiential, not about reading and writing, but about practice. It's embodied, and it's alive in that way. It's true that university classrooms, or even non-university primary and secondary school classrooms, this is a terrible way to transmit language. I mean, language was never meant to be transmitted with a teacher at the front and drilling you with verbs and adjectives. It's, it's really not set up for good transmission. In terms of what it does for heritage, I think is a really interesting question. Now, um, maybe in northern Finland and places like Aotearoa and Hawaii, there are still enough speakers, mother language speakers, first language speakers, to transmit fluidly and fluently. I've seen a lot of language immersion programs where the people doing the transmitting are themselves learners. Right? So they are active learners trying to recreate a level of comfort and fluency mm -hmm. in the process of teaching. Now, there's also very interesting examples, two in the states that I know of. One is of the Miamia language and the other is of Wampanoa. Um, two languages that didn't have mother tongue speakers for about 30 or 40 years, but through partnerships with linguists, community members, and interestingly often translations, um, evangelical work, scriptural translation, etc., missionaries and documents, they've recreated a language which is now being taught for the first time. Two of these people, um, Daryl Baldwin and Jesse Little Dobert, were both granted MacArthur Genius Awards one year after the other a few years ago. So this work is getting internationally recognized. And there's a real sense that it's not the that, that outside linguists don't have the right to proclaim a language dead or extinct. Because you all the time deal with this perverse situation where there are speakers of languages that have been proclaimed to be dead. And what does that actually mean? So heritage, I, I don't think, comes into the conversation um, in those immersive language programs as I've seen it. But what they're doing is learning language on the land. And that's more and more programs are taking kids out of the classroom hunting, fishing, gathering, whatever it may be, to learn language in place. And that's the other problem that many of these school classrooms or university classrooms take language out of place. They are inherently decontextualized. That's a whole other set of pedagogical challenges. Chris? I, just in terms of your last point, you had touched on in many ways, but this issue of revitalization of potentially extinct languages, and of course in the face of the UN saying we're million species facing extinction, yeah. that some languages will. Invariably. So 
in terms of sort of issues almost like rescue and heritage, mm -hmm. what is the appropriate response in that there must become a risk factor with language when if you get to a critical point, very few speakers. Is it is it the equivalent of DNA seed banks in terms of oral or the idea that it could be revitalized in the future? You're quite right, Chris, that there's a lot of um let's say, useful conceptual categories and metaphors that people like to use to explain this work. And really in the mid-1990s, linguists were emboldened, partly because of the success of the conservation biology program that spoke about species extinction and safety and security and endangerment, and also by the writing of a linguist by the name of Michael Krauss in Alaska, who wrote a very provocative piece that said, hey, linguists, you are, we are, as a community, about to go down as the only discipline in Western science presiding over the demise of its own subject matter and doing nothing. We need to do something. So uh, a great response, um, both research councils, international foundations, private philanthropic organizations, really got this idea of language endangerment active. And there was a lot of borrowing of the conceptual apparatus from conservation biology. The thing is, while it's helpful to speak about endangerment, um, the absolute number of reproductively active speakers is not the key factor in language sustainability, the way that it is for species. Right? You could have a very small community somewhere in the remote part of the world where there's only 100 people who speak it, but all generations speak that language. That language is more secure and safe by linguistic estimation than a language that has 60,000 or 100,000 speakers, where all those speakers are above the age of 50. So it's the intergenerational transmission that matters. There are also no captive breeding programs outside of university language courses for languages. Right? We don't have zoos. And a number of organizations have tried. Google has gotten involved, and other foundations are kind of trying to do this mass collection and curation of, of linguistic data. There is the point, however, that if you think about the work as multi-stage, without good documentation, there's no chance of bringing your language back. So some communities are focusing their attention right now on documentation. They say, we don't want to be involved in revitalization right now. We want to document. If we're ready, we'll reactivate those collections. Others are moving through straight into revitalization programs. And there's a real tussle, which goes on to this day, between some uh, linguistic field workers who say, it's our duty to document as much as we can, even if communities don't want that. And communities saying, it's not your job to come in uninvited to document our language if we're not in interested or invested in that. There's an interesting parallel there with the burning the fire of Notre Dame, and the one response that basically is saying all the world heritage sites, and the risk of that now must be scanned. So that you have the potential to revitalize and some of the issues you're talking about. It does have, actually, there is a parallel with that in the sense of document. Indeed, and you know, indigenous Twitter exploded after the fire in Notre Dame. You know, obviously very concerned and devastated, but also this is a mass outpouring uh, for something that happens to us every day. Mm. Interesting. There's a question up there. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, triggered some really interesting ways of, of looking at this uh, subject. Uh, to a certain extent, I think you've already probably answered the question uh, that I was going to ask. Um, which, which is about um, the very strong link, as I see it, between the language, the culture, and the location, the space. Uh, I very much liked your mentioning the link to the use of ecological terms that make sense within their own management of, of, of their uh, biodiverse uh, environments. Um, and, and to take an extreme position, is a family talking uh, an indigenous language in a tower block in a major urban space really a, 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 living, a living language? And I'm thinking particularly, because I know your experience in Nepal, of the um, very sad um, exodus of, of a lot of the Nepalis to urban areas um, some distance from Nepal. Thank you. Um, maybe three brief thoughts in response. Um, 
First, there's a very interesting group based in New York City called the Endangered Language Alliance, which started a few years ago and got some attention from the New York Times on the front page, in fact. And it's a group of, of committed field linguists who realized um, not only about the carbon footprint, but you don't need to get on a plane and fly around the world because New York City is home to 623 indigenous languages that have come to New York as people migrate to move for opportunities. The problem has been that those communities often within the cultural realm of diaspora communities are overwritten by a dominant language. So whether it be people from Himalayas or from Mexico, etc., who are, are kind of clustered with the Mexican expatriate community but speak indigenous languages uh, in the, at home, you know, in the workplace if they have friends to speak with. The second point um, is that as people move, sometimes you see remarkable stories of kind of linguistic reconnection. Um, after some of these films about Tibet that were necessarily filmed outside of Tibet, some in the Andes and also some in the Atlas Mountains in Northern Africa, Tibetan extras and communities who've been brought to film in those places felt so immediately comfortable in these mountain environments, they set up home and settled and I have been using the Tibetan language in completely different but equally mountainous ecosystems. A very interesting example of kind of a language moving and reconnecting, albeit in a different space. The last example perhaps is more poignant, and I should say I've seen um, that very process that you described of kind of linguistic attrition and diminishment um, in the Himalayas. I've worked with a number of uh, speakers of indigenous languages, elders who are absolutely fluent and performatively expert in their language, in their village, in their tradition. And then as we've moved together to Kathmandu, by medical treatment or for other reasons, they found ever less that they can speak about in their language. No words for bus, no word for technology, etc. And they've actually, in the space of one day, an eight-hour bus ride, sort of transitioned from being proud speakers of their language in a village context to awkward speakers of Nepali. Uh, in the national context in the city. So, yes, the location does matter, and it can do a huge amount of damage to language. At the same time, there are these glimmers of hope and sparks of unexpected sort of vitality. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, a few more questions because it's so exciting. <laughs> yes. um, thank you very much, Mark. Can I, your story about those two your story about those two um, young uh, girls whose uh, whose name caused all this controversy, spelled in a highly complex uh, orthography, uh, really made me think about my own work in the Middle East. I do a lot, a lot of work with native um, with minority communities who speak languages which are not written down. And I I've done a lot of workshops trying to teach the communities, the speakers, how to write down their language, which is an incredibly challenging task never written down the language to actually write it down. And um, of course, I myself have done documentation as a scholar of, of their languages, but when I first started to work with, uh, in these workshops, I would try to actually teach them the somewhat complex transcription system I used with a variety of phonetic symbols and diacritics, which are very much like these native, uh, these Gulf Coast, um, and uh, these First Nations languages, so uh, obviously. And then I, I came across a lot of consternation, and it was really an obstacle. And then I, they said, well, can't we just adapt and we'll, I, I, we need to write in the modern world things down on, on our keyboards, which don't have all these symbols. They're not default the keyboards or iPads or whatever, they don't have all these symbols. But, so now they, I've changed my policy, and I, and I teach highly simplified. Which is simply usable on, on, a, on a default keyboard, and they are, and this has actually been the key to actually to to, to facilitate them to write their own language, and it's sort of an adaptation to the the wider world. And if they, if, but if I was to dig in and say, right, you need you need to write, you need to have your own particular orthography reflecting exactly your the phonetics of your, your language, that would be disenfranchising from the actual documenting and, <coughs> and preserving their own heritage. So, so it, 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 it is a question about which should we dig our heels in, uh, in terms of the certain the orthographies which are created for these, these vernacular languages. 
I'm very happy to answer this question. Thank you for the analogy and the example you gave of your own work as well. The languages of what's called in outside of Canada, the Pacific Northwest, um, but that whole strip of, of coastline, are extraordinary for many reasons, phonologically, semantically, syntactically, extremely complex. But also, they're extraordinary because behind pretty much every writing system of any of the 34 indigenous languages that we see lies an eccentric European linguist. And not the same one. So, <laughs> this was an early era of kind of linguistic documentation and exploration. And many of the linguists who worked on these languages created their own specially modified variant of the International Phonetic Alphabet, within that the North American Phonetic Alphabet. And it's, it's been a cause of ongoing discussion and consternation. Some communities, as you describe in your work, um, feel that firstly their language was taken away through residential school and dislocation, colonial policy, and then there was a second wave of alienation which is they were detached from their language by the writing system given them by the linguist. And I spend a lot of time with elders who can speak language but can't read and write, and with young people who can read and write but can't speak. So they're two different forms of competency. At the same time, some communities have two or three different writing systems in circulation at the same time. And as long as people are consistent, and they can map onto one another. So you can say there's a linguistic writing system and orthography that's really useful for documentation description, and there's a learner's orthography a teaching system. At the same time, other communities are saying, don't simplify our writing system. A, everything else has been taken away from us. This is uniquely ours, and the fact that it's a little bit scary is a good thing, <coughs> right? Because it it's sort of disincentivizes touristic engagement. At the same time, it celebrates complexity. Our languages are complex. The powerful thing about these IPA-based phonetic renditions and orthographies are that if you can pronounce the symbols, you have a transparent system, unlike English. So you have a kind of what you see is what you get model. So there's quite a lot of time spent learning what these things actually mean and then producing those in class. There's a great deal of discussion around this. And other communities I've worked with don't want to have a writing system at all. And they resolutely remain in all of space and resist all forms of orthography. I think we take questions from Rebecca, and then Axel, you had your hand up, and then I think that might be Thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to bring up the Canadian case. Because um, when I went into the deal in 2017, 79.9 nine million dollars had just been invested in the indigenous language and culture, which is the exact same being invested in the French language, which seemed to be like a very big get no surprise actually. Um, but where was that money? Was that money going to you spoke about on the land initiatives and stuff like that? Um, I got to experience this when I was in the field and, and I also wondered if you see that like talking about languages relations, that reconnection with the land. Do you, do you think it's helping in land and self-governance processes now? Like, I, I think it will, if not now, then in 10 years or so. Um, but yeah, I just want to give off on that. And if more investment is going into additions, I wouldn't know how to find out, despite they'll see anyone not having gone through it. Uh, thank you for that. I haven't traveled to the Northwest Territories, and I know that you have, so I don't have experience of it directly. I will say there's a lot of interest in much more um, experiential education models for language, right? So taking language out of the classroom, getting it out of the kind of sage on stage model to embody land-based activity. And that's that's true across BC, certainly, and I know it's true also in the Northwest Territories. I mean, part of that is kind of relearning the landscape and relanguaging the landscape. I mean, there are so many traditional place names, toponyms, uh, that you can't learn in abstract, you can't learn them from maps. And there's also a lot of innovation technologically. Um, there's now these kind of walking tours you can do, and you can download onto an iPad these sort of augmented reality or, or VR-like spaces where you can visit places that maybe are hard for you to visit uh, using the language. And back to kind of Mark's very nice comments after, after my talk, the museums and archives are finding ways also to connect the collections that they hold, increasingly in trust for community. I'd like to mention the Smithsonian, for example, has a great program called Recovering Voices, 
at the Museum uh, of Anthropology, MOA at UBC, very close to where I work, um, is doing very innovative work in community partnership, realizing that it's archives, museums, and collections that often have recordings of languages that need to be reconnected, they need to be reignited, re-energized. Um, so that's, that's an interesting relationship, bringing archival resources to language revitalization. But I think your point about the money invested is welcome. It is interesting that the same amount of money would go into one official language, and maybe you know, 11 indigenous languages or more. So is that comparable? But then on the other hand, how many speakers? So these are complex, contested spaces that need to be discussed publicly. And you know, the kids need to be involved as well. Excellent. You'll have the last question. <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, we've we'll been looking at this for the period of time that we've been discussing here. That's a great question to ask. And I, I'm just a little bit curious um, about, we've touched on it briefly, the relationship to the environment around this and the significance it plays in people's relations to languages. Um, you mentioned briefly the Wampanoag people of uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And there's actually a lot of anxiety in that group right now because a lot of their coastal sites are corroding because of climate change. And I was wondering if maybe you could speak a little bit more uh, to the point of how climate change may be negatively impacting language. It's a very good question to end with because it's one that I'm really going to have to sort of bounce back to you and say I'm grappling with this as well. Um, I, I, I know of these anecdotal stories of communities being faced with new kinds of flora and fauna on account of um, global warming and changing environments that they don't have words for. Then what do you do? Of course, communities have always been innovating, creating new words. What happens, however, when you've been forcibly relocated, either for, as for climate refugees or because of just dislocation, colonialism, and you have words for place, but they're all of a place that you don't live anymore, right? And you haven't been able to reconnect with that place. And how long do those words continue? I think the ecological argument, tying language to place, while powerful and compelling, can also foreclose language revitalization. So if the argument is that it has to be embodied, it has to be in place, then if people move, you say, well, then you don't have it anymore. Right? You've lost it because you're no longer connected to territory. So I think we have to be careful of that kind of um, almost kind of teleological nature of those kinds of arguments. But generally speaking, how ecology and language interconnect, certainly around climate change, is a really interesting emerging space. I'd love to know more myself. Ecological linguistics is gaining a great deal of visibility in the field now. And the term bio-linguistic or bio-cultural diversity is one that has had currency for some time. Uh, one of the leaders of that is uh, an Italian linguist by the name of Luisa Maffi, who set up an organization called Terra Lingua, and they're based on Salt Spring Island, just off the coast of uh, Vancouver. And they've been exploring across the world areas that are rich in flora and fauna, but also areas that are rich in languages. So that correlation, causation not, but correlation, is very intriguing and lends itself well to kind of greater study and research. So thank you for the invitation. I wish I could say something more coaching. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank all the people asking questions, all the people listening carefully. Mark Elliott for his very nice thank you note. And please, with all of you, could we thank Mark Turing for having entertained and fed us so many ideas for a bit more than an hour. Thank you.